I'm with ETC in the Netherlands. Um, my question is directed to Dr. Heile. Uh, we were all very excited about the pastoral policy framework and that it was then approved in January 2011. And I know that you are following very closely what has happened since then. And that is something I would like to hear about. What have the member governments done since then? We shall take a few questions together and then we'll, we'll get the answers. So the lady next to you. Uh, I'm Inge Barmetlo. I work for uh, CORDET and also for CELEB. CELEB is a coalition of uh, European organizations working on pastoralism. Um, my question is um, in relation to Francesca Mosca. Uh, I've, I very much liked her presentation. I have one point which relates also to what Professor Swift said, is that one uh, thing that needs to be addressed is the invisibility of uh, pastoralism and pastoralism in policies and statistics. And uh, Francesca Mosca said that in the uh, agenda for change, pastoralists or pastoralism are important and crucial and are mentioned. But as far as I know, in the agenda of change that I read, they are not explicitly mentioned. They are somewhere indirectly included. So I thought maybe it would be a good idea to include pastoralism more explicit, explicit in this uh, agenda for change because it's such an important document or if also for the European Union and because of what Professor Swift said. Oh, sorry. A second question is related to what uh, and Water said is about uh, to the African Union, Mr. Abebe, about indeed uh, implementation of the framework, how, and especially because a number of countries are not so supportive of it in practice. So how does the African Union go about implementing the framework in practice? Thank you. Was there some interest on that line again? Yeah. Down. <coughs> Thank you. I followed the presentations very closely. I'm from uh, Niger, a country where pastures and accounts for about 40% of land use. But I was interested to know whether you think that there is a conflict between the need to promote pastoralism and the need of our economies today to uh, modernize, modernize. Is there a conflict between these two needs? The need to promote pastoralism and on the other hand the need to modernize the structure of uh, animal rearing so on and so forth. Can I have the gentleman down there? I'll go row by row. I'm from, from, from the liaison office between um, uh, Brussels, uh, Belgium and the European Union. I have a comment and a question. First of all, I'd like to make the point that notwithstanding the relevance and the quality of the presentation which have been made here. I think there were nonetheless a number of issues uh, which were important, which weren't mentioned. I'm talking about challenges which uh, pastoralism is having to contend with. First of all, there are issues relating to uh, climate change and drought and uh, recurring famines, uh, political conflicts in, in, in Mali, I don't think I could uh, ignore what's happening in terms of insecurity in pastoralist areas, particularly in the north. And then the issue of demographic pressure and the culture of lands which have uh, traditionally been set aside for uh, animal, uh, for livestock. All of this uh, constitutes an obstacle to the way we currently exploit uh, pastoralist resources. So I think 
we need to reconsider uh, the way we think about pastoralism in the context of these challenges. So we need to put it in the right perspective and we need a, a better, more systematic approach when it comes to the use of pastoralist resources in terms of water, grazing, crossing points, uh, pastoralist routes, and we need to think about other people who are using these resources at both the regional a local and regional level. I have a question for Haile, who's from the African Union. I'd like to know how this initiative relates to the CADEP. This is the uh, detailed uh, African agricultural program, which represents the if official reference for agricultural development and this also includes uh, animal uh, breeding and partialism in Africa. Thank you. May I propose that we those are about six, five questions. We can take another two and then we, we, we have the lady right at the end. I'll come to all of you. <laughs> okay. Merci, je suis Saudi. Thank you. I'm from an organization which uh, looks after the interests of pastoralist women in Sahel countries. I'm also a member of the executive committee of Walmart BIP. I'm a member of the International Committee for Civil Society which is uh, concerned with uh, food security. I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Abebe and Mr. Dodo. Is collaboration when it comes to the promotion of indigenous peoples and the working group of the African Working Group on Human Rights within the context of the work you're talking about uh, within the African Union. I think it's important that we take into account of displaced uh, pastoralists. Our organization recommends that uh, we take these displaced uh, uh, pastoralists into account, in particular when it comes to Mali, Mauritania, Algeria. They are confronted with a cross border uh, insecurity. But generally speaking, these uh, countries uh, are in habit of uh, placing these people who are displaced in areas which aren't uh, suitable. I think we need to think about uh, the survival of these people. No more questions on that side. So I'll take now no, one more person. I'll take you, and then we'll we have those six. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Anur Mohamud Sheikh. I'm with the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, Geneva. I come from Somalia, a country uh, that you neighbor that Kenya has uh, currently has military engagement. Um, but we still maintain good neighborliness with Kenya. My question is also to um, um, Dr. Abebe. Um, there is an existence of um, a, a policy, um, a legislative document in Africa um, that was formulated by the African Union called the um, African Union Convention for the Protection and Assistance to the Displaced Persons um, to uh, the uh, protection and assistance for displaced persons. To what extent has your policy framework fed into that? Because it is very important that document is a legally binding uh, document. It's a continent-wide uh, um, uh, legal instrument uh, that aims to provide protection and assistance to internally displaced persons. Um, 
My other comment is um, regarding the um, issue of peacemaking in Africa. Many African countries are undergoing um, a conflict, um, especially the Horn of Africa. Uh, and and, and uh, in most cases, there are peace processes going on. Um, it is very important that um, pastoralists are involved in these peace processes. I wrote to Kofi Annan when he was negotiating um, uh, for, uh, in, in Kenya uh, to, um, to, to, during the uh, uh, post-election violence, uh, saying to him that, look, uh, conflict in Kenya is not only based in Rift Valley, one part of the country. Conflict in Kenya takes place in northern Kenya, where pastoralists face a conflict situation uh, throughout there. Uh, the same goes, you know, in Ethiopia, in Sudan, it's not in the CPA. The CPA is all about uh, uh, wealth sharing, uh, sharing of oil and, and, and the relation between uh, the, the, the Khartoum Party and the uh, SPLM. So it is important that um, uh, uh, during peace processes, Pastoralists are also involved and, uh, and their predicament is taken into account. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Let, let's first of all deal with those six questions. The panelists, each of you knows what, what question impacted on your presentation. I'll start with you, Professor Swift, and then we go down and as, we, as we did the presentations. Very briefly, please. Thank you, Chairman. I, I ticked three questions that I think I have something to say on. The first one was from our, our friend from, and colleague from Niger about uh, asking whether there is a contradiction between modernization and traditional pastoral society. I, I think probably he was referring especially to education. I don't think there's any, con any sort of contradiction there. Uh, if you look at pastoralism in Europe, it's, it's, uh, it's in the hands of highly educated people. Uh, if you look at pastoralism in Mongolia, where there's a hundred, there has been for 30 or 40 years, 100% primary school enrollment. So every pastoralist has at least primary school behind them. Uh, if you look at uh, I I the case of Iran, where I have a great friend who has, is a pastoralist, uh, lives in a pastoral area. He has a Cambridge University doctorate in mathematical economics. I can't understand a word of it, but he lives perfectly happily there uh, and goes and represents his area in parliament. So I don't see, I don't see any necessary contradiction between those things. Uh, second question was our friend from the FAO, lia EU liaison officer, whether, whether a number of things have been taken into account. Pastoral development is extremely complex, uh, as, as I think we all know, and th th there are a whole number, a whole raft of, of, of subjects that have to be dealt with. I could only deal with a few of those because of time constraint, but I think we need to, to look at that, that whole raft of things that he identified when we're thinking about pastoral development. Uh, the third question was about internally displaced people that several people mentioned. Uh, the only thing I have to say there is just, uh, I don't know whether there's anybody from Mali in the room, but the situation in Mali at the moment where I was just before Christmas is catastrophic. Uh, I'm told that the best estimate that I can get is that there are 85,000 Tuareg, Malian Tuareg, who are out of the country, who are now displaced into neighboring countries. Now, this is something that affects pastoralists on a very big scale, and I think we have to be aware of that. Thank you. There was a question raised um, on um, Madam Mosca's presentation. Maybe more do you want to deal with it? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Well, in fact, a mention has been made to, uh, to the agenda for change, where it is true there is no specific mention of pastoralism. But uh, there's a clear commitment to making agriculture in a more sustainable way, and especially in, in the context of a changing climate. And I think <clears throat> it, it is in that respect that uh, the Commission is engaged in supporting the policy framework, the evolution and implementation of the policy framework, as well as supporting the, the organizations of the producers, and includes the pastoralists. As we know, there was a call for proposal that was launched on this respect last year. The idea is that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, trying to, to, to make, to translate into practice, as it was stated, the policy intentions that have been, uh, that have been addressed and, and that have been raised here, I think that is the main concern. Nowadays, differently from what was the case uh, 20, 30 years ago, there's a more favorable, more positive uh, policy framework for pastoralists. There's not only the African Union, but even at regional levels when you come at the IGAD policy initiative on livestock, then you have the ECOWAS, as we've heard. You also have in the COMESA documents you have referenced. And the idea is that trying to support the implementation of those intent 
is what is needed to, 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 to make pastoralism, uh, let's say, more viable, because it is viable if it is, uh, if it is properly supported with a the, with the policy that, it, that is also implemented. So it's not only policy that remains on paper, but it comes down to the ground. And as we've heard, the challenge is there, not only in having nice policies, but in, in getting them into, into practice. And in that respect, I, I, I'm afraid that still in the, in the dreams of most, uh, of most policymakers, as I've heard even recently, the dream is to make rice in the islands. And I think that dream is very costly, is not feasible, and if it is, I mean, if it is feasible very often, it's just for a very short term. Whereas if we would be able to better appreciate the production of animal proteins that are very important for nutrition purposes in the islands, that would definitely change the the attitude um, I mean, towards pastoralism, and that is what we are trying to, to achieve, and that is, comes back somehow to the agenda for change when we say we want to make agriculture in a more sustainable way, and I think producing animal proteins in dryland is the best way to go. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Dr. Abebe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, those uh, participants who have uh, raised uh, questions and comments. Uh, now let me start from um, the uh, relationship of this pastoral policy framework with CADEP, which is the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, how it is related, uh, because I think by addressing this particular issue, uh, I believe that uh, I, I would give clarity to other questions as well. Now, the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development Program, uh, which was adopted in 2003 uh, by AU Assembly in Mozambique, uh, is a framework. It's a kind of development model, if, if you wish. Even though the last letter uh, is P, program, it's not really a program. It is a framework, a framework uh, on, of development based on uh, priority given to agriculture, because in, in Africa, much of, uh, well, agriculture is the dominant uh, sector in terms of not only production, but also uh, in terms of the number of people who are dependent on it. We are talking about 80, 85 percent of the total population dependent on this sector, which is uh, a low performing sector. So any development prospect, overall development of the countries hinge on uh, a successful transformation of the agriculture sector itself. So it was from a realization of this important aspect that the CADEP was adopted as a framework. It is to give priority to agricultural sector uh, and which would be um, exhibited in terms of resource allocation, investment and so on with a projection of growth to be achieved 6% uh, per annum by 2012. So broadly, this is what CADEP was. Now, CADEP uh, missed initially a very important element, which is livestock. Livestock forestry fisheries were missing. They were not highlighted in the initial document. It was later that these aspects were incorporated. This indicates another you know, lesson that uh, which we talked about, marginalization, that the pastoral communities who are dependent on livestock production were not receiving the attention, the policy attention that they deserve. So reintegration of this aspect within CADEP was an important uh, aspect of the process. Now, where are we in terms of CADEP implementation? As we speak, 30 countries, 3-0 out of 54, have uh, prepared and signed what we call a CADEP compact. And uh, more than 20 of them have uh, developed agriculture and food security investment programs, investment plans based on this CADEP compact. This exercise involves alignment of development policies, projects, and investments with the CADEP requisites. So when we engage our member states in assisting them in facilitating the implementation of a particular decision, 
such as CADEP or the pastoral policy framework, it is through these processes. When we say 30 countries have signed, it means they have identified the priority subsectors within the agriculture sector, they have identified the resource requirements of this, and they have indicated, they have identified what kind of institution, institutional arrangements they are going to put in place and the reporting requirements. We, moot, we meet uh, every year in what we call the CADE partnership platform to exchange views on progress in terms of implementation. So this is a general framework. When it comes to progress on implementation of the policy framework on, on, on pastoralism, it was adopted more or less a year or so ago. The two important uh, commitments that we have made at the level of the Commission was to come up with an institutional framework to, to, to facilitate implementation. Because this is a regional, a continental policy framework, which would be implemented at regional and national, large, largely at a national level. That one we have done. As I indicated, we have designated an institution, which is Inter-Africa Bureau for Animal Resources, to be responsible for rolling out this together with regional economic communities. Whether or not member states were objecting to this, this was the, 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 uh, the way it was, are not interested, one of the advantages of engaging member states through the policy process is for them to come up with a policy framework such as this one. You know, the heads of state, the 54, at that time, 53 heads of state and government, they discussed this paper at the ministerial level and at the heads of state level and adopted a policy framework. This is a political commitment. So when they give us this instrument, which is a very important tool of advocacy, we should be able to use it. So we cannot assume that uh, our member states are, are not interested in this. We believe that they are interested, they are committed. That's why they have adopted uh, this policy framework. It's up to us now to really engage and facilitate and support them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I know I, I, time is uh, of essences, but let me just assure some of the participants who have brought into the picture the issue of conflict uh, and, and insecurity. If you look at page 17 of the policy framework, conflict is uh, already there, and we have taken into account all the instruments, the policy instruments that have already been adopted, including the convention that uh, you've mentioned, in developing this. So this one is an addition. It complements to what already exists. We consider those as important foundations upon which this uh, is built. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abebe. You made a new presentation. I hope it doesn't raise new issues. <laughs> <laughs> so because of time, we'll listen to Mr. Dodo. Again, on if there are any issues raised. Merci beaucoup, je n'ai pas. Thank you very much. No one put any questions to me specifically. But a question was raised, which I think requires me to give my position. The question which was put to us was a question which comes up uh, all the time, partialism and modernity. Everything depends on how we understand uh, modernity and the content we accord it. We know that partialism uh, is very adaptive, but if the uh, economic model adopted by countries, if we're talking about models which are based on other things apart from family farms, well then we may have to contend with a number of problems. This is why we feel that, uh, at least as far as the Sahel is concerned, is to base uh, economic policy on family farms. So from that point of view, I don't see any conflict between modernity and pastoralism. The conclusion I wanted to provide was that despite a regained interest in pastoralism with all these new 
texts, we know that a number of countries uh, have basically decided to accompany the, the death of pastoralism. If you read between the lines of these texts, what they're going to do is try and ease the death of pastoralism. Uh, many uh, politicians feel that this is a system which is going to uh, disappear entirely over the uh, medium or long term. But uh, we do nonetheless have lots of partners there to try and support pastoralism because it's a sustainable form of production which uh, has a long future ahead of it. But these are the two uh, problems we have to balance and we have to really read between the lines when we read these texts. They're really talking about accompanying uh, pastoralism up to its death. Mr. Kraz, do you have any comments? Yes. Yeah. The, the European experience, there is no contradiction between pastoralism and modernity. Uh, I think that we have, uh, for instance, experience of, um, of um, local improvement of local uh, races, so improvement in the genetic, uh, so it's uh, to facilitate the condition of living of, of farms, and uh, if you, you build this, uh, this initiative on the local breeding, you can also uh, find niche market, you know, you, you differ, differ, differentiate the, the production using local breedings, and uh, with uh, genetic improvement, if, if I give an example, in the, in the Pyrenees uh, Massif, uh, uh, a family farm can live with, uh, with a cattle for, for 400 units, where in the past you, you, you needed one, more than 1,000 units. So it's, uh, you have an improvement of condition of living of the, of the farms using local breeding. So you are integrated in a local food supply chain, uh, chain which are specialized on local breeding and you have uh, better working conditions. Uh, merci. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm from Senegal, the School of Agriculture. Well, I wanted to make a comment more than ask a question. Earlier on, Mr. Dodo was talking about the problems a pastoralist have when they have to make decisions three months in advance and how this uh, poses a number of problems often. In Senegal, we have a program which uh, seeks to estimate uh, natural resources. The pastoralism's main problem is the availability of uh, natural resources and their use. There is a program of uh, natural resources estimations or forecasts. This is something which was launched a number of years ago and it, it represents a double advantage. First of all, we are aware of what the available resources are at the end of the rainy season and this also allows us to um, uh, identify very rapidly any problems there may be. For example, in the case of a fire, this is able to be identified within a quarter of an hour. And there's also a feedback system which allows uh, pastoralists or local development officers to be alerted in good time of any problems. And this uh, helps us avoid many problems uh, related to this uh, early decision which uh, pastoralists often aren't really in a position to make. Merci. Microphone for the speaker, please. Again, unfortunately, the speaker's lost her microphone. I'm from Morocco. where I've worked on all uh, pastoral systems, in particular in the uh, Saharan steppe. And this uh, gives us an opportunity to clarify something about pastoralism and pastoralists. Everybody's talking 
about the need to rehabilitate uh, pastoralism and how it's important that we support pastoralists. So I have the impression when we talk about pastoralism and pastoralists, we're talking about a system which is in a kind of enclave which is founded exclusive on uh, animal rearing but the systems I know do they exist everywhere so for example in the countries where you work where you may be a pastoralist or a decision maker or a researcher here pastoralist societies are egalitarian now are there countries where there is a hierarchical pastoralist system I know that this is the case in Mauritania where we're talking about the ownership of herds. And this is something we need to talk about uh, when we talk about uh, modernization. Now we're talking about uh, businessmen. Uh, in the past, we're talking about uh, cross-zone, cross-regional uh, businessmen. Now we're talking about international businessmen. And there's this whole illegal side of things, which was touched upon earlier on, where we're talking about moving around. And then there are these other pastors who live in tents, who live in uh, precarious situations. Well, I'm, I don't want to go on for too long, but if we're able to address this issue, I think people will be able to see a pastoralist in a different light, because the pastoralists themselves uh, or or the, have a strategy, and then we have other uh, farmers who have their strategies as well. But it's true that when we look at these statistics, and this was a point made by uh, Professor Swift, which was very important, when we talk about, for example, agricultural development in Rocker, we saw, see that uh, the owners of uh, large herds with about uh, uh, 3,000 heads, for example, uh, come under pillar to uh, uh, solidarity and then we have uh, pillar one where you're talking about uh, fattening uh, cows and then we're talking about tons and tons of water Let, let's please make the, the, the interventions as brief as possible in the interest of time I think we have three more thank you chairman and for the sake of time I will go direct to ask uh, Dr. Bibi uh, one of the main root causes of the problem between uh, tribes and, 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 and government, the free movement of the pastoralists between place to another place. I think one of the main objectives for me to be included in the AU policy framework is that the free movement of at least advocacy for free movement from one state to another state. Now they are moving from Sudan to Asuba, from Sudan to South Sudan. But at the end of the story, they create a problems. Why they don't include at least advocacy to free movement from state to state? And also they include uh, related issues, just like the animal health and hygiene. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, the lady. Thank you. My name is Ilse Köhler Rolofsson from the League for Pastoral Peoples, and I just want to make a comment, uh, pulling together various strands from the various presentations, starting out with uh, Professor Swift's remark on the lacking visibility of pastoralism, then about the comments on the legal system improving, but actually the laws not being implemented, and finally the, the comment from Europe about the quality of the products from, from pastoralism. And there is actually a new tool called Biocultural Protocol, which is a tool under the Convention on Biological Diversity that can, in which communities or pastors themselves document their role in conserving um, biological diversity and ecosystem. And this actually entitles them to certain rights under the Convention on Biological Diversity. 
uh, it's kind of a claim to in situ conservation. And um, this tool, the biocultural protocol, first of all, it's a statement by the community itself. And secondly, it can also draw attention to the quality of the products, because I think that's really important. It's not just about the quantity of um, animal protein that can be uh, generated in dry lands. It's also the quality. The quality is so much better and so different from the livestock products that are generated in industrial systems. Thanks. Okay. We'll take the comments um, in sequence again, only if you are touched, uh, if, if um, the question touched on your presentation. Professor Swift? Okay, nothing. Um, Abebe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I promise I'm not going to make a third round of presentation. <laughs> uh, yes, I would, uh, I would like to uh, comment on the question raised by uh, my brother from Sudan. The mobility, the issue of mobility, and uh, the policy framework um, actually sets out by recognizing uh, mobility as an important feature of pastoralism, and therefore, uh, if you have a copy of the paper on page 29, section 2.2, it actually talks about policy support, policy support to mobility within and between countries. Uh, the problems uh, associated with mobility is not only uh, related to uh, mobility between countries, mobility of pastoralist communities between one to the other, but even within the same countries, there are so many. Uh, problem there. So it advocates for policy support to facilitate such kind of mobility. Uh, so the answer is yes, it has been captured. Thank you. Okay, je vais essayer de répondre. Well, I'll try and respond to the point which uh, related to the early decision-making of pastoralists. I'd say that pastoralists have always had strategies for making decisions. They have information, they observe natural phenomena which allow them to make uh, quick decisions. But in the current context, so many constraints have been placed on their movements that it's becoming increasingly difficult for them. Now, if I I refer to the International uh, Convention on Transhumans. We're talking about uh, environmental issues. For example, if there's a famine in uh, Niger, then the uh, partialist will know very quickly that it's not going to be a good season. So his uh, tr uh, decision to move is already made, but where he's going to go and when is another issue. Generally speaking, we'd be talking about moving towards the south, where water and pastures can be found. But now we have a problem there. Often we find that the routes are more populated now, or people don't want uh, pastoralists going to these areas for one reason or another. It's not that they don't have a strategy. They, they they do make a decision to move or to sell some of their herd. So I, I'd say that pastoralists have always had a strategy, and that's why they've survived for so many years. Now people are talking about whether there isn't some sort of hierarchy in the pastoral system. But a partial society is like any other society. If today we're talking about problems of pastoralism, when we look at the uh, uh, this from the point of view of colonization, we see that colonization encouraged a system which excluded pastoral societies and and pastoralists. So, if we take the case of uh, Niger. There, the uh, 
we had uh, the Napoleonic Code, which had a great influence on uh, legislation in francophone countries. And this legislation don't recognize um, uh, common lands and uh, pastoralist values. And this call, uh, cast doubt on uh, values which had been held for centuries before that. Now, if we want to help these people, it's important that we uh, give these people uh, a recourse, a legal recourse. If we look at education then, if we look at the outcomes of our uh, school systems, it excludes uh, a pastoralist as, as an option. So no one leaving school would really wants to remain a pastoralist. So we have to bear in mind that uh, because of the legacy of colonialism, a few and few people want to become uh, pastoralists. Thank you.